Are you struggling to pass the CPA exam? Did your review course fail to fit your learning style? I'm Darius Clark of I-75 CPA Review, the number one course supplement, where the right teacher makes all the difference. And if you took the CPA FAR exam and didn't pass, you probably received a score report that looks something like this. And if you want to pass FAR, you're going to have to improve your basic understanding of concepts. Maybe you tried to memorize, or maybe you try to do thousands of multiple choice questions. But if you're going to pass FAR, you've got to know the journal entries. You've got to understand what they're asking so that you could recognize it, attack it, and move on. What I call the RAM method. So in section three, where it says select transactions, that's 20 to 30% of the exam. One of the topics from that area is revenue recognition. And we're going to look at that right now. And revenue recognition includes a lot of different little topics. One of them is principal and agent. And that's what this first question is going to be about. Valent Communications signs up wireless customers with AT&T service from a kiosk in the local mall. What do they want to know? If Valent Communications has no discretion over pricing, and if AT&T maintains control of the cell phone numbers prior to delivery to the customer, which of the following is correct? So this is a revenue recognition question on principal versus agent. And they're setting Valent up here as a typical agent. So let's see. They tell us that for each cell phone number activated, Valent Communications collects $15 from each customer, but has to remit $10 of it to AT&T. So really, what's in it for Valent? Just $5. So if they're considered to be an agent, they can only book revenue for $5. But if Valent is somehow considered a principal in the transaction, then they can book revenue for $15 and cost of goods sold for $10. But if they're just an agent, they can only book revenue for the $5 that they really keep. And that's why it says Valent Communications has no discretion over pricing. And AT&T maintains control of the cell phone numbers prior to delivery to the customer. That's how you know Valent is just an agent. So which of the following is correct? You're looking for the answer that says Valent's just an agent and should only recognize revenue of $5 for each phone number. And that's letter A. B says as an agent, Valent should recognize revenue in the amount of 15 and then show an expense of 10. No, that's if they were a principal. C, as a principal, Valent should recognize revenue in the amount of 15. Well, that's if they were a principal, but they're not. They're an agent. So C is out. D, there does not appear to be a relationship of principal and agent between the two. No, there clearly is AT&T being the principal and Valent being the agent. So the proper journal entries that Valent should make is debit cash, for 15 credit revenue for five dollars and then credit a liability due to other merchants because that's what's due to AT&T every time they get fifteen dollars and then when they pay AT&T they would debit due to other merchants and credit cash the incorrect entry that the revenue recognition rules have done away with is debiting cash for 15 crediting revenue for 15 the agent is not allowed to do that anymore only the principal could do that entry and then debit cost of goods sold and credit due to other merchants. And then debit due to other merchants and credit cash. While the income is $5 either way, agents can no longer book revenue for the gross amount if all they are is an agent and not the principal. Then they have to book revenue for the net amount. Because what was happening before the rule changed was that these agents were able to show incredible revenue increases when they were booking revenue at $15 a phone, but really they were only getting $5 a phone. It just looked better than it really was because they were able to book revenue for 15 and then cost of goods sold for 10. So the industry, the accounting industry decided that rather than fool investors by how much incredible growth some of these agents are having by being able to show these revenue figures that they're not really earning, let's make them record the revenue at net since they're just an agent. So that was a question on principal and agent. But revenue recognition is a pretty big area. And would you be able to answer a question on a bill and hold? Let's check it out. On January 1st, year five, seller enters into a contract with a buyer for the sale of a compressor and spare parts. The compressor will take eight months to build. 
On September 15th, year five, the buyer pays for the compressor and spare parts, but the buyer only takes possession of the compressor. What does the question want to know? Seller can recognize revenue on what? So they've delivered the compressor by September 15th, year five, but they haven't delivered the spare parts yet. Why? The buyer inspected the spare parts, but rather than taking possession of the parts, the buyer requested that the spare parts be stored in the seller's warehouse because the buyer does not have a place to store the spare parts. So this is a classic example of a when the buyer could have taken possession of both the compressor and the spare parts because both were available at that time. So the seller can recognize revenue for both the compressor and the spare parts on September 15th of year five. Not because that was the date that the buyer paid for the compressor and spare parts, but that was the date that the compressor and spare parts were available to the buyer. A bill and hold is an exception to the general rule that shipment of the goods has to take place before the seller can recognize revenue. The seller can recognize revenue for the spare parts provided those spare parts are available for immediate delivery to the buyer and the buyer is the one that requested that the seller hold the spare parts and the seller cannot use the spare parts or transfer them to any other customer. And then the seller can go ahead and recognize revenue on September of year five for both the compressor, which has been transferred to the customer and the spare parts that has not yet been transferred to the customer because there is a valid requested purpose by the buyer for this bill and hold. Good, so now we know that a bill and hold is the exception to the general rule where the seller would normally have to ship the goods in order to recognize revenue. But if it's a bill and hold, the seller could recognize the revenue once the item is completed. Let's do another question on revenue recognition from the all important topic of long-term contracts and the percentage of completion method. This question wants to know how much gross profit does Mason Construction recognize in year five? And they tell us Mason uses the percentage of completion method. During year five, they sign a contract to build a bridge for the state of Texas for 20 million that should take three years to complete. They estimate total costs incurred over the life of the contract will be 15 million. So they're gonna make 20 million, but they gotta lay out 15 million to make 20, which means they expect the profit of five million. In connection with the contract, Mason incurs costs in the first year of $3 million. So 3 million of the 15 million is spent already in year five, which is the first year. That's 20%. In year five, Mason bills the state of Texas 2 million, but receives payments from Texas in the amount of 500,000. How much gross profit does Mason Construction recognize in year five and what they build out and what they collected are not gonna enter into our calculation of profit because under the percentage of completion method, we're going to use the costs that have been spent to determine the profit recognized. So total gross profit over the contract expected to be 20 million minus 15 million or $5 million. Since 3 million of the 15 million or 20% has been spent in the first year, then using these input methods, the contract is 20% complete. This means that 20% of the $5 million expected profit or $1 million should be recognized as profit in year five. So the answer to the question is A, $1 million. You're probably wondering what the journal entries are and I'm gonna tell you. So we're gonna debit construction in progress, CIP. That's a $3 million debit because construction in progress is inventory, so that's a current asset. So debit that, construction in progress, it holds the costs to date plus the profit to date. And we know the profit already for this year is a million dollars. And we're gonna put that into the journal entry too. But the first entry, we'll just put the costs in of 3 million, what was spent this year, and we'll credit cash for that same amount. Then they told us about the billings. So we'll debit accounts receivable. We expected 2 million to come in. We credit progress billings. What kind of an account is progress billings? Progress billings acts as a contra asset to construction in progress. So that's why it has a credit balance because it's a contra asset. CIP is an asset, progress billings is a contra asset. We build out two million, got paid for only 500,000. So you can see the entry debiting cash, crediting accounts receivable. And notice that all three entries made so far were balance sheet only. Construction in progress, a balance sheet account, progress billings is a balance sheet account. 
and of course cash and accounts receivable are. So what about the income statement? This is the percentage of completion method. We already determined we're going to recognize 20% of the $5 million expected profit or $1 million. So let's see the last journal entry now. And you can see that we're going to debit construction expenses for the $3 million that was spent. The same $3 million that we already put on the balance sheet in construction in progress, we're going to put on the income statement as construction expenses. And the million that we already said is going to be recognized as profit in year one is debited to construction in progress because CIP holds not only the cost, but also the profit. And then we credit revenue for four million, which we could plug or we could determine that it's 20% of the overall $20 million of revenue expected under the contract. So this question only asks for the gross profit recognized in the first year, and the answer is a million dollars. But if this were a sim on the exam, you'd have to know all the journal entries. And hopefully you found those questions easy to follow. But let me ask you this, would you have been able to answer them 10 minutes ago? What you just experienced, I call the I-75 difference. No lecturing, we just go over the questions and what you need to pass. And the best part is once you sign up for I-75 FAR, I'll be your guide. You let me know, say, hey, Darius, I just signed up for I-75. Here's my score report from the previous time I took the exam. What should I do first? What should I do next? And I'll take care of that for you. I'll tell you where to begin and where to go from there. So go to cpaexamtutoring.com, get yourself on I-75, where the right teacher makes all the difference.